Thanks very much for coming. My name is Billy Osteen from the College of Education. I'm also the director of the UC Community Engagement Hub, which we will get into what that's all about during this session. Um, I want to thank you for taking time out on the Friday afternoon in week 11 to come around. Um, this is part of a class that we teach. So Eric and I teach a class that um, Sharon and Heather have been a part of that's called the Postgraduate Certificate in Tertiary Teaching. And it's a four class qualification for lecturers. And it's about higher ed teaching and learning. And so what we've done this semester, this class this semester is about teaching methods. So we've devoted four sessions to the attributes of the graduate profile. Hey Jenny, how are you? Four sessions to uh, each of the attributes of the graduate profile. And for this particular session, we've opened up the first hour to be an open session. So all of you are here, and as I said to Eric, um, none of the enrolled students are here yet. So hopefully they'll come along. Um, but we were planning to have this as, to be an open session, and then the second hour we will talk with our enrolled students about um, what we we're going to talk about today. So they did some readings in a lead up to this. Um, because we are a fairly smallish group, let's just do a very quick round of introductions. And if we can just have your name and, and what part of the university you're from, and then we'll get started. So we'll start with you with the sandwich. Uh, I'm, I'm Eric Brooks. I'm the uh, academic developer for the campus. Hey. And Jeannie Morris, student experience advisor and Philip Armstrong from the University of Yep. Uh, James Adams, I'm the first year visitor in computer science uh, from the University of Delaware. Thank you. Uh, Peter from the Department of Geography. Uh, Jared Robertson, Senior Engagement Coordinator from the Liaison Team. Uh, Kira Koto, Leanne Keenan from the Liaison Team. Hi, Sharon Goldstein from the School of Biological Sciences. Today's School Manager of the Liaison Team. Kara Koto, PhD in English. Ross Jay, Dean of Commons. I'm Tony Kent, I'm the School of Mining and Indigenous Studies. Good morning, I'm the new lifelong coordinator and I'm an adjunct in English. Lifelong coordinator, sounds like an eternal title. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. You're here. How, did you, how did you swing that gig here, lifelong. particularly in the College of Arts? Lifelong learning. Okay, there you go, all right, thanks. Uh, kia ora, I'm Rizla Chia from um, Law. Awesome, thanks very much. And um, I'll just reintroduce myself, Billy Osteen, College of Education, and also half of my role now is devoted to this idea of community engagement, okay? So again, thanks very much for coming along. Um, I am gonna present some stuff to you, but I'm also gonna ask you to do a few things. And as, we, as I present stuff, please stop me, please ask questions, this is meant to be a conversation. Um, this is part of the university's attempt to try to socialize or to talk about these attributes and figure out what they really mean and how they might apply to us in our individual disciplines or parts of the campus, okay? So here's the format, um, cryptic on purpose to keep you guessing as to what we're doing, but it follows a, a pretty simple framework that's called the golden circle. And it's a really good TED talk. It's been seen about 18 million times and it's a really simple concept of starting with why you're going to do something and then moving into how you're going to do it and then to actually what you're going to do. Okay? A lot of times we race to the what. So we design classes and we design activities and we do all this stuff, but we don't really investigate why the heck we're doing it. Okay? The attributes could be probably accused of being the same thing. We spent well over a year debating, discussing. Ross was a fantastic facilitator through a very tedious process of looking at every single word in all of the descriptions of the attributes and debating them. Okay, So we really focused on the what. Where I want to start with is the why, particularly on this community engagement one. Okay, Hello, come on in. And then work our way out to how we might do this and then give you some examples of what it looks like in practice. Okay, and I'm going to invite you to participate a little bit in a, sort of a mock exercise as to how we're going about this. Okay, so we need to get at this notion of why, and for that I'm going to ask you to please stand up. You don't need anything in your hands. Sorry if you've been with me before, this is one of my old tricks, but I'm going to do it again. It's a useful metaphor, I think. So what we need to get at is a why, okay? And I like to deal in metaphors. So the, the metaphor I'm going to use is a compass, 
okay? And if you have done any orienteering or you've used a compass, the first thing you need to do is to figure out which way north is, okay? That's your why, and then you can decide where you go after that. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to close your eyes, please. And I'll ask you to point in the direction of north. And it's not so much which way you're pointing, but I want you to think about why you're pointing that way, okay? Okay, so while you are still pointing in that direction, I'd like you to open your eyes and have a look around at what other people are doing. <laughs> yeah, okay. There are definitely some people to follow home tonight and some others <laughs> not to follow, and I'll share that with you in a minute. This might be an interesting disciplinary uh, sort of context with this as well. But, so anybody who, who would like to share why you're pointing that way? Don't worry about if you're right or wrong, just why are you doing it? Anybody? Yep. I thought about where the sun goes across the campus. Cool. Okay. So I, I may have that wrong, but that's what I thought about. Yep, yep. So sort of a local context, but also a, a, a bigger sort of meteorological kind of context. Absolutely. There you go. Cosmic. Global, local, cosmic. Awesome. Somebody else who had a different way to come about it. I located myself in my building, yes. and I know what side of the building is yeah, in that direction. Yeah, exactly. Where, where's my home base? Mm -hmm. And I know that, so then where am I in relative position to that? Cool. Anybody else have a different thing? Anybody sort of do a Google map sort of hover over and... Yeah, okay. Yep, what your normal pathway is. Yep. Yeah. Sharon, you had to be thinking of the coast, didn't you? Yeah, like, which way? Yeah, okay, exactly, exactly. And Heather's probably thinking, which way is Antarctica? And then that's the way, yeah. Okay, cool. So again, the, the point is not necessarily who's right or wrong. The right direction is that way, that is north. These classrooms, interestingly, and I've done this in a number of classrooms, a lot of them are oriented pretty clearly on a north-south axis. So it's either that way or it's that way. And people have all kinds of answers. Some people have answered, they, they point to the front of the room and that way's always north. Like, whichever way they're facing is north. I'm like, okay, I'm not following you around anywhere, right? Okay, so cool. So that's our metaphor, right? Which way is north, all right? So while you're still standing, if you could turn to the person next to you and tell them what your north is with regard to what your job is here at the university. Why are you doing what you do? Okay, go, 30 seconds. Okay, if I could have you back together, please. Awesome. So if I could just hear from a couple of people who we didn't hear from with regard to the, the direction. So some, some other folks who haven't talked yet. What did you say? What's your, what's your reason to be here? What's your why or your north? Yes? So I can write. So you can write. I have to write here. Yeah. Okay, write cool. Here. Yep, all right. Somebody else? What's your reason for being I'll here? What's your north? I said in brief, I'm here to recruit people who look like me, but then I have to qualify that. And that's what the advertising looks like, but people of another generation. Okay, that's that lifelong learning yeah, yeah. thing. Yep, cool. Okay, somebody else? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, so we have writing, we have do the rebuild, we have recruiting students. Anybody else have something that's different as to why they're here? Help students learn. Okay, help students learn. Cool. Yep, we've about got the bases covered there. We got research, we got teaching, we got a local context, and then we also have we need new students. Okay, cool. You guys can have a seat. So let me just share with you a few points with regard to this notion of why, particularly investigating this attribute which is called engaged with the community, okay? So just a bit of background, which I'm sure you already know this, but I'll just go over it again. So at the sort of roughly the beginning of 2012 all the way through the end of last year, we went through a campus-wide conversation about what we were going to be known for as a university. And we had this notion of a graduate profile. And a lot of themes, a lot of ideas got kicked around. 
in the end, we ended up with four attributes or pillars. Okay, a fifth one that is competence in your discipline. Right, we'll take that as a given. These other four are meant to be somewhat unique and mark us in some way. So within those, there's an attribute that's called engaged with the community. Okay, and I'll show you the exact wording for it in just a minute. So that was sent to the government along with plans to build two shiny new buildings, the College of Engineering facilities and the Regional Science Center. And the, the, it was sent to the government with the request to give us $280 million to put, build ourselves back up, right? The government said, yep, we like those buildings. Governments like buildings. They like to put their names on them. John Key will be here to open it, all that kind of stuff, right? But supposedly what we've heard is that they were particularly compelled by this idea of a graduate profile, okay? They were particularly compelled by the idea that we said, yep, we want all of our students to come out of here with a degree. We want them to be able to get a job. We want them to be competent in their discipline. But we also want them to have these four characteristics, all right? The engage with the community one started with the Student Volunteer Army. There's no doubt about that. That is the originator of it. And then as we have worked it through, it's now working into other ways. But by far, that's where that thing came from. Okay, and that originated from 2010 and 2011. So that's sort of where we are. Okay, so we're going to investigate this engage with the community attribute, right? So let's look at some reasons why that might be something relevant for us to do. Okay, and I'll start many, many years ago with the ancient Greeks, okay? So the Greek word idiot means somebody that's consumed with their own affairs, okay? And the Greeks had a belief that everybody was born an idiot, and it was only through education that you became a citizen. To them, that was the highest ideal, right? And a citizen is somebody that's concerned with public affairs. And this was done, they thought, through education, right? A little bit more recently, John Dewey from the US, he had a belief that education was not about preparing for life, it was about actually experimenting with life itself. Okay? And for him, the real point of education was for us to learn how to work better together and to co-create our social environments. Okay? So real emphasis on experience. Right? A little bit closer to home, in 2007, one of the last things that the labor government got through was the New Zealand curriculum document. This is a legal document. It binds the New Zealand education system throughout the land. It primarily looks at years one through eight because NCEA takes over for high school in a large way. But in a sense, this is what guides every school in the country, or it should, okay? Within it, it had five key competencies. One of those is called participating and contributing, okay? And this is how it's defined in there. It's about being actively involved in communities, all right? Right now, schools are only held accountable, I would say, for one of the five key competencies, and that's the one that measures numeracy and literacy, all right? There are these other four that sit there called managing self, working with others, et cetera, et cetera, participating and contributing, and those haven't been really attempted to be measured yet but they should be part of what is in every kid's experience who goes to school here in New Zealand, all right? And then this one, this is our law of the land essentially, right? So this vision statement that we have, people prepared to make a difference. These four attributes, if you wanna think of them as this way, are the pillars that hold that thing up. They're the pillars that support that notion of people being prepared to make a difference, right? And so the exact wording of the attribute for the engage with the community is students will have observed and understood a culture within a community by reflecting on their own experiences and performance within that community. Does that look familiar to you, Ross? Painfully so. <laughs> so that's our law of the land. University Council passed it at the end of last year at their very last meeting in December. It is now on all of us to implement this attribute along with the three others, okay? And the trick with this is the government's money has not come to us all in one nice bundle of 280 million. It's being drip fed to us and it's being drip fed based on meeting certain expectations. Okay? One of those is trying to recover Fs. Another one is how are we performing in accomplishing these attributes. Okay? Right now we control the metrics for these. 
So the government hasn't come in and said, hey, we need you to show us X thousand students have done this, blah, 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 blah. We're in control of it up to a point. And my suggestion is if we don't take control of it sooner rather than later, it's going to be given to us as to how we take control of it. So we, we have complete say as to what we do with this right now. And I'll give you some ideas about how we might play around with that. Okay? Any questions so far? Nope. So that's, that's sort of what binds us. We're, we're legally sort of contractually bound, if you will, to follow through on these attributes. They know going back on them. That, that ship has sailed. Okay? And what we think the best way to do it is to turn these attributes over to degrees and to programs and to say to them, can you tell us at some point in time, two, three years, how you are providing students with experiences within their coursework, within your degrees, that help meet this attribute. It's not a competency, so we're not going to measure people's ability on this, right? That's way too complicated. The way I'm viewing it as they are experiences. And they are never ending sort of competencies, right? We're never going to be fully engaged with the community. We'll never be fully biculturally competent, confident, et cetera, et cetera. These are things that we work toward. Okay? And further, these only apply to undergrads at this point. These do not apply to postgrads. So we're talking undergrads. Okay? So those are philosophical or conceptual reasons. That's all fine and good to talk about it in sort of that, that bigger sort of air. Here's some reality. Okay? So for me, there's some practicalities behind this engage with the community attribute. The first and foremost one is that this is an absolute imperative in New Zealand that we have students, particularly university students, that come out of here ready to engage with the community. Okay? And the reason for that are these numbers. So New Zealand, more than any other country that I can find, is highly dependent on volunteers. So we're dependent on volunteers to run the schools through boards of trustees. We're dependent on volunteers to put out fires through fire brigade, surf life-saving, jury duty, blood donation, St. John's, blah, blah. Yes? Billy, actually, you're legally obliged to respond to a jury because It's not actually voluntary. Mm -hmm. You absolutely are. But my experience of this was I got called for jury duty two years ago. It was during January, so I decided to do it. I kind of wanted to do it. I was interested in it. And overwhelmingly, the, the response I got back from colleagues or people who are at similar socioeconomic levels as me is, why the heck are you doing that? You could have easily gotten out of it. It's not that easy no, these days. Tricky. They're getting tougher and tougher about enforcing. Yep. So I fully agree but with I, you. I take your point about there the is, attitude. That, yeah. That's right. That's right. Not everybody who gets the summons readily shows up ready to, ready to do it, right? Um, I'll show you some stats on the Board of Trustees figures in just a minute, but anybody have any comments or questions about that? Yeah. Um, this is a kind of ideological comment. Yes. Um, you tend to get greater uh, reliance of a society on volunteers and charity when government withdraws. Absolutely. Providing social Absolutely. Support. Yep. And so one argument about what universities should be doing is questioning that yep. ideological or something. Absolutely. And that was, that was interestingly one of the philosophical debates we've gotten into with the core group of the student volunteer army folks. Mm -hmm. Because we said, look, you guys did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Had you not done that job, that crap would still be sitting in people's driveways. Right? Mm -hmm. But by doing that job, you let some people off the hook. You let the government off the hook. You let city council off the hook. You allowed them to not have to go into particular areas and face people that were living pretty rough. So there's a philosophical challenge with that. So, so we have to accept the fact that, that there's been a choice made at some point, you know, way back when, sort of the, the villager mentality maybe in New Zealand, that we'll all contribute that will all help run the schools and put out fires and save people from the ocean, blah, blah, blah. We're still in that choice, and that's not necessarily a great choice to make because it makes it ex an extremely vulnerable country. It's a series of choices. Isn't it, it, it absolutely is. Keep choosing not to fund fire. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and so it's kind of like how do we play along with that system, but yet how do we challenge it as well? You know? And when I've shared this with students, they've been absolutely shocked. They've been like, wait a minute. You mean if we didn't have 
the 17 folks out in the Sumner Fire Brigade just decide tomorrow they didn't want to show up because they're not getting paid a dime to do it, we wouldn't have a fire brigade. Hell yeah, we wouldn't have a fire brigade, that's it. So it's a very, we're in a very vulnerable position as a country. So if we continue down this path, we absolutely have to have students that are ready to take on these roles, because right now we're not funding them. Okay? So I've done a bit of work in looking at school boards of trustees, and a couple of things are going on there. So in 2010, which was the last cycle of elections for boards of trustees, almost half of the schools in the country did not have an election. And the reason they didn't have an election was because they either had the exact number of candidates for spots or they had fewer. Okay, so over half. So you can't get much more local than that because the people that vote for a school board of trustees membership are parents or caretakers of students. You can't get much more closer than trusting somebody to run your kid's school, right? So these are some schools that I looked at here in New Zealand. So these show you the parent positions and then the numbers of votes, the role, the percentage of the turnout. And as you can see, this is a pretty large school, 800 to 1,000 students. So theoretically, that would be 2,000 ballots if you get two ballots per household, assuming every household has two parents or caregivers, which they don't. So let's just assume it's 1,500. 274 people voted. That was it, right? So there's two breakdowns there in this participating and contributing. One is just sending in a ballot. I mean, that doesn't get much easier to participate and contribute. But the other is somebody actually stepping forward to want to run for the board. Okay? This does have a decile correlation at some point, And the, the relation is about at decile seven and above. Then these numbers start to turn around. Six and below, that's where these numbers are. Okay? So again, if we continue, particularly if you think of university graduates, those are, those are some of the folks that should be ready to take on these kind of roles. And one of the things we found in Christchurch with the, the nonprofits is that we have a decreasing amount of people willing to serve on boards. We've got a lot of people willing to volunteer, but very few people now are willing to put their hands up and serve on these boards. Okay? This is sort of an overall thing. So in 2013, which was the latest stats that I could get from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, they estimated that 28% of New Zealanders volunteered during a year. Okay? The majority are between 40 to 49 years old, which is interesting. I thought it was going to be an older age segment, but it's 40 to 49. And it continues a downward trend. The percentages used to be about 45, 40% about 10 years ago. Okay, so it's going down. Interestingly, in, the, in, the, in people that identify as having Maori heritage, the number goes up to 90%. Now, a lot of that volunteering is acknowledged to be directed fairly locally and within a cultural context. So at a marae, within your iwi, within your hapu, within your immediate cultural context. But 90%. And when I was talking to some young folks who were who were Maori students coming here to visit campus, and I showed him this, and I said, man, you all can teach us how to do this, because you're already doing it. And you're not even really calling it volunteering. That's not, there's not a direct Maori word for volunteering, right? It, they don't really have that word. It, the word that they use is more of a, a contributing without, um, with compassion, okay? So we, we could have a lot to learn from how Maori volunteer beyond how we do it. Any questions on this? Comments? Okay, so that's practical reasons. Again, Student Volunteer Army. Um, one of the things that we have found out, one of the, the reasons why those folks decided to do what they did was time. That was one of the main reasons. It wasn't that they were from a particular religious background or ethnic background or anything like that. It was the fact that we cancel classes for a couple of weeks and they had time, right? There's been an interesting experiment that's been done in the States called the Good Samaritan Experiment. And basically what it was, it would be as if you all were some seminary students 
and I was teaching you the story about the Good Samaritan, which is where somebody stops along the road and helps somebody out that they normally wouldn't help out, and, and there's a good bit of breakdown between what normally were some class boundaries. Anyway, I'd be teaching you this parable, and then the experiment went like this. Somebody would come to the door and say, hey, we need some, one of the, the seminary students to go teach this parable to this class across campus. And then the controlling variable in the experiment was the amount of time that you gave that person to get from here to the other side. And what they did was when they sent the student out you know, from here, they would have somebody laid across the pathway that they would have to either walk around or walk over, right? <laughs> The only factor that they found that controlled whether that person stopped to help out or not was the amount of time they were given to get from here to there. And that's to teach the Good Samaritan experiment lesson, right? Bizarre. It had nothing to do with background, nothing to do with their, their notion that they're there as seminary students. It was simply time. And then they've done a really funny tweak on this in the UK. And they've done sort of the same experiment but the person laying across the pathway would have on a soccer uh, jersey from a team, right? And what they found was that there were two factors now that came into play. One was time, but then the other one was if the person was a soccer fan at all. And if they were a soccer fan, they would stop 85% of the time. And then further, if the jersey matched the team that they affiliated with, 98% of the time, right? So some interesting things there to pull out. So one, we know that time is a huge, huge factor. If people don't have time to help, even though it's right there in front of them, they probably won't, right? The other one has to do with affiliation. We tend to figure out, we tend to figure out ways to help out people if they're like us, or if we can find some reason that they're similar to us. Thank you, believe some of the perceived time these days, because you know, thinking about like, especially in a small community where I and Twizel, you know, it used to be like if everyone did one volunteer thing, yep. the whole town would be fine. Yep. But now we find there's like about three or four people that are doing all of it. And, yep. no, and a whole lot of, dare I say it, slightly younger generation yep. have had this perception that they have no time to volunteer. They yep. have time for it. I'm, and I kind of think, well, is it that they actually don't have time or is it that people perceive time differently these I days? I think they do. They fill their time with other things yeah. that, that aren't volunteering. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think we. There's definitely a notion that we're time poor for lots of reasons, double income, technology, whatever. But I, I totally agree with you. I wonder if we actually looked at the way people use time, if in fact they had as much time as folks who had to go pump water out of a well or get their food every day from a local source, you know, that kind of stuff. But there is a perception that you don't have as much time. Okay? I think the economy of the country too has an influence on it, the two job economy. Yep. Absolutely. Like in a coal mining town. Yep. Some people here probably know. And and with that many halls, you could hardly you know, go down the street without bumping into a hall. The druids hall, the odd fellows hall, the yeah. miners hall. They built all these halls. They had different societies. The women met in them. The men met in them. The union met in them. They had all sorts of country women's institute. There were lots of societies and groups. Partly because people were so distracted, there wasn't so much. That was your connection. That was a connection. Yeah. So they had time, but also there was usually generally only one income being earned. Yep. So you have another thing here with absolutely time. Absolutely. People aren't just time poor, they're money poor. Yeah. They're working one not just one job, three jobs, something. Yep. Ursula. I, I, I mean, for many, well, quite a few years now, we've had governments who are running the economy in a way that mm. says, don't worry about community, just worry about you. Eco income, it's, it's individual. It's and, uh, yep. and our young people pick yep. this up. And, and so you hear people you know, of our generation and so saying things like, why don't we teach civics anymore? Yep. Because there is no understanding of what being a citizen Absolutely. is about. Yep. We have a government that endorses it and yep. it's a way of life. Yeah, absolutely. And you wonder this whole sort of debate about the flag and all that kind of business. I mean, it, that in, it, in some ways that's a poor excuse for civics, isn't it? Like that's a poor, it's not a very substantial way to talk about what we stand for. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'm not knocking national because nope, they nope. started, you know, this yep. has just been an ethos yep. from the last, yep. you know, 30 or so. Yep, yep. I'm just uh, reflecting on the um, statistics you put up about um, board of trustees in schools. Yep. And when you were talking about it, 
I was ex I was thinking about the same point that this person said about double incomes, working parents. Mm. No one has time. Yep. <laughs> and but then I was interested to see that it was actually people in the high decile areas who were more likely to, yep. to be doing it. And I would have thought yep. it'd be the opposite because those are the ones where they've got the higher incomes and they've probably got two working parents. Yep. And so I'm, I don't know if there's any explanation for why you know the lower decile areas might be less likely to have two working parents. I, th I think or it they just earn less for what they do. Uh, yeah, and I think it also comes to confidence and right. and having. The, the confidence to feel like you could serve on a board of trustees, whereas in a higher decile area, I've, I've served on a board of trustees and we had a lawyer, an architect, an accountant, uh, a human resources person. We had people, we had 13 people running for five places, right? Because these were all people who were confident to serve on a board, whereas maybe in another area, you just haven't had people that have been supported to be confident to say, yeah, I can serve on that board. But also low income families often have to work longer hours. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, their work, their work, yeah, the, of the, the board members that we had, we were all pretty much, we had some control over our schedules. Yeah, yeah. more autonomy. Yeah. yeah. And they also don't feel engaged, why should they feel engaged with the community that's not particularly engaged with them? Yeah. Yeah. And you don't feel a part, you don't feel like, again, maybe you just don't feel like you have the invitation to help, help create that community. It's been done to you, but you don't have a way in. To, do, to, to contribute to it yourself. Yep. I think okay. There's a middle class angst about your children's education too. That gets I think that's a part that. of it. I've seen that in, in my own children's schools. I've never seen so many parents in the classroom with their children. Yep. And yep. In high income, so they that's can right. have one adult in there and all of that. And particularly with school, because you might have a pattern um, maybe in, in a lower socioeconomic area where people just haven't had good experiences in school in the first place. Yeah. So then why in the world would you want to go put yourself forward to, to run the place? Because school is not a welcoming place, nor is it a place where you perceive of the ambition pathway that you might in another one. Yep. Okay, so that was practical reason number one. Practical reason number two. Um, there's been a lot of research done on this idea of using community engagement or using some kind of service within studies, right? So there's heaps of studies. Most of them are uh, point to the positive. There are some that don't point to much effect. But this meta-analysis that has a lot of students uh, within it, within these studies, points to some pretty, these three basic things, right? So what these studies point to is that students who are in classes that have some element of community engagement, they seem to be engaged more with the topic, okay? Um, those classes also seem to indicate that students have some more engagement with who they are as a person in defining what their values and their identity and their morals are, right? And then the other big one is this notion about civic involvement. The more you have students engaged in the community, the more they do say, yep, yeah, we can shape this, we can play a part in this, we can play a role in this, okay? So here at Canterbury, this was some work done by a PhD student uh, that I supervised several years ago, and he looked at two specific classes, a uh, 200 level management class and a 300 level geography class. He basically was trying to, to see, were students in those classes more engaged than their peers across campus, okay? At the time, we were doing this thing called the Aussie, which is the Survey of Student Engagement. So he looked at what was the overall picture of student engagement for a 200-level student at Canterbury. And then he looked at what was the specific engagement of these students in that class after they'd taken it. Okay? And so largely, he found what I was suggesting just a minute ago. They seemed to be a bit more engaged in their experience. Definitely, there was a more active learning element and they had different relationships with staff than otherwise. Same with the 300 level geography class. His qualitative analysis pulled out these main points. There was active learning. Students felt like they were doing something for a larger purpose than handing a paper into a lecture. And this one was the idea that they were different after they'd done it. And we have followed that research up with the geography class in 2013 and the results are, are pretty consistent. So a pretty small scale study, pretty sort of experimental in how we were trying to use instruments, but done here at a local level trying to say, what does this look like here at Canterbury? Because it's all fine and good that this stuff appears to have effects somewhere else. What's it look like in our context? Yeah? Can I ask what effect it has on the staff that teach into these 
Heather can probably tell you a little bit about that because she's been pretty involved in it. I mean, my experience of, of being involved in it, the effect it has on me is one of decentering me from the, the power, even though I'm standing here talking to you as if I'm in control. Um, it has a leveling effect. Um, and particularly if you, uh, if you invite community partners to be co-instructors with you, then it flattens things out a bit more. Um, and it, has, it forces you to give up a lot of control because as soon as you leave this room, the variables that you had control over start to just multiply and you don't have control over them anymore. So that's been my experience. I've had to, to loosen my stuff up. And even though I like to be in control, it kind of goes out the window. Heather, what's been your experience? Yeah, I think that's a really um, good way to describe it. I think I've got it. Yeah, it's this, you become more facilitated to the students. And, and sometimes I, think I find you actually develop um, almost better rela working relationships with the students because you're a facilitator and you're putting more of the responsibility on them to be driving their projects and then reporting back to you. And you kind of, you're, tre you're treating them, I guess, almost more like an ad you know, adults and peers and things as opposed to, that, yeah, yeah. It's, a different, yeah, it's definitely a different power relationship. Um, but it, it does take a wee while to get to, you know, this year I had an amazing group that I was getting sent emails telling me when to turn up and... Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, like, yeah it, was, it was kind of like, whoa, oh, my group's really organised. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. You know, really quite interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, that collegial thing. I, when I was doing this in North Carolina, um, this class I was working with were prospective middle school and high school teachers. And I had this one guy in there that was just a real country boy. And I could tell he just didn't have too much time for me. He thought I was you know, just a little too city-fied and too soft. And our project was this really weird project out sort of outside of Raleigh where this old uh, zoology professor from Chapel Hill had started this farm for carnivores that had been pets of people like tigers and lions and all these kind of crazy big, big cats. And of course, when they get too big to be pets anymore, they had to go somewhere. So he effect, in effect had this private zoo. And so we were out there trying to help him substantiate these fences so he could get USD approval for it to be an educational facility. Anyway, it was just a bizarre place to be working, you know, right across from this big cat. And so I was working next to this country boy, you know, and we were having to dig a fence in. And he kind of looked at me at one point because I was all sweaty and muddy and he was showing me how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. And he just said, I never thought I'd see my professor out here getting dirty with me. This is great. <laughs> and it, it was cool, you know. From that day forward, he was my guy, you know. He uh, had credibility with him, even though I didn't know crap about shoveling a fence hole, and he was showing me how to do it, that it leveled things out immediately. And it gave him a place where he was in a, a position of being an expert. And what I've seen here, when I've gone out to do some work, particularly with engineering students who've grown up on a farm, just get out of their way. Man, I don't know anything about backing a trailer. I don't know anything about doing all this stuff those guys can do. And it immediately puts them in a really cool, powerful position because they can bring the skills that they've just picked up growing up to bear. And does that help the learning process? It's helped engage them with me more and engage them with the content more. And I have to think that helps the learning. I can't guarantee it, but it seems like it would. Yeah. But it does take a bit of a shift. Similar to being out on a field trip, and then once you sort of turn things loose a bit, you, you invite a bit more risk uh, on a number of levels, but I think it's ultimately worth it. Yep. Okay. This was a student, um, Ursula, you'll like this, that um, had taken our class just as an elective or as an extra thing, and she actually found out that studying the law was going to be able to help somebody. And we like that. <laughs> So that's, in terms of professional development, I think this idea of community engagement gives students an opportunity to actually see how their discipline gets applied in a real life situation and then go, oh yeah, that's why we're studying law or sociology or biology or whatever it might be. One of the things that we found out from Student Volunteer Army core members, particularly two young women who got law degrees, was that when they went for job interviews in early 2012, their experience on the student volunteer army was highly, highly valued by law firms, right? And it wasn't valued for the fact that they organized volunteers to go shovel a bunch of silt. It wasn't the thing that they did, it was the fact that they did it. And the real life experiences that they got while doing it. And this guy in the state, Sullivan, says that we should not separate these things of professional development 
and community or civic development, they're one and the same. It's learning how to work with people, solve problems, come together. Reason three, this on the left is the Mental Health Foundation, Five Ways to Well-Being. You can see a number of those would have something to do with community engagement. This over here is my friend Eric Brott's notion of intrinsic motivation and what gets you engaged in something. And I have a firm belief, again, that, that doing this in, in a guided, structured way can lead to those two things. These are three quotes from the same student in Christchurch 101 at three different points in time. Uh, we usually go out and do a couple of big volunteer projects as a class, and we ask them to reflect on those. We don't give them any sort of parameters. We don't try to poison the water or anything. We just simply say, how did that make you feel? Typically, they feel like they're the Lone Ranger. They've come in and they've saved the day. They've helped these poor people. They've you know, done this, blah, blah, blah. Then we bring in a little bit more critical thought about this. Did they actually want your help? Did you ask them how they might want it to be helped? Blah, blah, blah. Then they typically feel pretty bad, so this is a confessional. Yeah. Yeah. Feel some guilt. So we go from assurance to doubt to nuance. And that's usually where we want students to end up, that they have re-examined their values and beliefs based on their experiences, and they've come to now recognize that life actually is kind of like a swamp. It's a lot of gray. It's not as clean as it first seemed. Okay? So I'm going to give you a couple examples, get you to do something right now. So this is the how part. So that's the why. That's why I think this is important for us to do beyond the university council telling us we have to do it. Those are the reasons why I think it's important. Here's how. So this is a model called service learning. And it has been around in the States since the late 60s. It sort of sprang out of a leftist hippie kind of movement. Um, and it's persisted. It's kind of marginalized now in the States. Um, there's usually a unit or an office devoted to this on every major campus, but typically the uptake there is, is pretty marginal, to say the least. It consists of three components. One is some academic content. The other is some kind of service experience. And then the, the most important piece is critical reflection. Okay. What we have found is that this is the least important part. And this is what you get fixated and you focus on and that's all the logistics and that's everything you spend your time doing. This is the most important part. And the reflection is about both the content and about your personal development and your personal beliefs. These are the outcomes that are associated with those components. So there's a notion of, of professional education. There is an idea of citizenship or civics or whatever you want to call it. New Zealand doesn't seem to like the word citizenship that much, but it's the idea of civics or being a part of your community. And then this idea of personal growth. Okay. All right. So let's do something. Um, normally I would ask you to go out and do something, but we'll stay in here. So if you could think of a time recently that you helped somebody, it could be you held the door open for them, you bought somebody a coffee, Whatever. You built a house last weekend for Habitat for Humanity. It doesn't really matter. But I want you to get that experience clear in your mind. So think of a time that you recently helped somebody and what the situation was. And I'd like for you to share that with the person next to you. And then what I would like for you to tell them is why did you do it? Okay? So go for it. About 30 to 45 seconds. What did you do and why did you do it? Okay, if I could have you come back together, please. Okay. So, so let's put this into that framework here. So let's...
take what you've just described in helping somebody, okay? That's the service component. I'm about to give you an academic component to this, and then we'll reflect on it, okay? So what are some examples that you provided about helping somebody, providing service? Or what did you do? Oh, what did I do? Yeah. I, I take my neighbor's papers and put them in the morning. Cool. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody else? I helped a student who was in legal difficulty and also very upset. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Somebody else? Yep. I pulled over um, and checked a dog that had almost been run over and found his just name and number and called the owner. Wow. Very nice. Okay. Somebody else? One other one. Help a friend break up some concrete around in this place. Cool. All right. Now, let's talk about why you did this. Okay, this is the content. So there's a guy in the States named Adam Davis. He says that those things that you have just said could be boiled down to one of five reasons as to why you did them. Okay? What do you think those five reasons might be? Yep, so he, he'll phrase it as empathy. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so that's one. How about another one? Ability. So, yep, so you had the skill to help somebody, so then, yep. That's kind of in there. You'll see it in just a minute. How about another one? Yep, that's definitely there. Yep, in two ways. Making yourself feel good. And I'll show you his phrasing in just a minute. It's a bit blunter than this, but yeah. it's all right. Um, one more. Somebody else. Improving. Go ahead. Improving somebody's, uh, somebody else's yeah. life. Yeah. yeah, and that's there too. Okay. So he says this all comes down to five reasons, sort of what you've been describing and maybe a couple more. Okay. So when I put these up here, take a look at them. And if you had to put the thing that you've just talked about helping somebody else out, if you had to put it in one of these, which five would you do it? And let's just say it's a forced choice. You've got to pick one of the five. Okay? These are, he's done it to be provocative. And the reason he's done this is he says too often we provide help or service or assistance without thinking about why we've done it and further without reflecting on was that really the best thing I could have done and why did I do it? because he really centers it on the giver, not the receiver, okay? So here are his five reasons. Okay, any comments about his five reasons? If we were limited to those five, to explain our action. Don't know. It's not really there, is it? Share the earth, is it? Share yeah. What I can give you, is it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Could be praise ish. Yeah. Oh, I nearly put my hand up and said, I think we need something about building community because I think one of the reasons we help others is we're actually trying to foster community. Yep. And that's kind of, I think, where this we share the earth. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a communal one. Yeah. Well, I don't see that one or two could need to be distinguished either, actually. I think. We believe one often believe two is part of, part of one. Yeah. Isn't, isn't there also something about your own sort of subjectivity, the, 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 yep. the thing that you do uh, helps contribute to your sense of who you are and you don't want to be the kind of person who wouldn't do this? Right. Or you want to be the kind of person who would do this? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Self-image. Yep. And I guess self-image could be yeah, somewhere in here because it's a notion about here's who I want to be, here's who I project myself to be, I do that by my actions, that kind of stuff. The interesting thing about his framework, and students don't like this, and they, won't, they don't like the thing I'm going to do in a minute to you, which you probably won't like either, <laughs> is when you're forced into doing this, it, it often might make, make you see some things a bit differently, right? And also to recognize that there's no real value judgment on any of these five. We put, we put the value on it, right? Like this one, this one. <laughs> yep, I mean... It looks like the value. Well, the value judgment might be, um, the value isn't the fact that you did it because you're guilty, right? The value is that, that you would perceive somebody else saw you doing it because you're guilty. 
And I'll give you an example. So one of the ways that we do, we play around with this in the class is before I show the students this, I say, go out, you got five minutes, go out and do something that you would define as helping somebody or service. And usually students go and they pick up trash. That's an easy one, right? Some will be a bit more adventurous and they'll put up post-it notes in the bathroom that say smile or have a good day. Hopefully they say that, I don't know, I don't go actually look at them. <laughs> Uh, but, but some students will do some really interesting things. This one young woman came back in and she said, as we were sharing what they did, and she said, oh, I went and collected the cigarette butts and threw them away. And I said, oh, that's interesting because this is a smoke-free campus. And she said, ah, oh, but I'm a smoker and I know where the cigarette butts are. <laughs> right? But it was quite interesting because she, def she identified with this big time but she was walking down the path with this handful of cigarette butts and she saw somebody that knew her and she said she consciously turned away so that they couldn't see what she was doing. And then she went and threw them away after they walked by. So in, in fact, she was here and she didn't want this at all. She didn't want to receive credit. She didn't want to be seen as doing that because it was tied into the other one, right? So it's just, and he's being provocative. I mean, of course there are more reasons than this as to why people do things or why people help people. But when you're forced into it and you begin to think about it, you're like, okay, what is the reason that I've decided to pick up the neighbor's newspaper or to bust up the concrete or to save this dog? Did he generate these things from a, some existing lack like, of meta analysis or did he do his own study? Or? I think it's, a, it's sort of a thought piece that he wrote. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. And it's around the notion of trying to break down the concept that all service is good service. Mm -hmm. That service is simple and service is good. And he was in this field for quite a while and he was quite frustrated from white, middle class, affluent university students going out and building a house for Habitat for Humanity and thinking they've solved the world's problems and never investigating, why did you do it? And could you maybe have done something a bit differently? Exactly, exactly. He's all about power and about what this kind of work evokes in terms of forcing us to look at power and inequality. And if, in fact, sometimes, kind of what you were suggesting, Philip, sometimes we might go out and do this stuff and we're actually just reinforcing the existing crappy structure that we want to change anyway. But we've played into the system enough that we're helping prop it up. Unwittingly, perhaps, but we are. Okay? So one more little exercise here and then we'll, we'll round out. So another sort of piece of academic content that I'll share with you is the Torah and a certain section in the Torah that has a ranking system about helping people out. Okay, So the Torah was very explicit. It said, if you're going to help somebody, here are the eight ways to go about doing it. Number one, best. Number eight, worst. Okay. So this is some content that I'll share with you, but I'm going to have you do the experience first. So again, if we were to go out and do some kind of service, this would be a way we would investigate it and a way we would match this up with the content. Okay? The way we'll do it in here, just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to give you eight examples of helping, and I want you and the person next to you to pick out the best one and the worst one, and then we'll fill in the rest. Okay? Here we go. Okay, so you and your partner find the best one out of those eight, come to some agreement, arm wrestle, do whatever you need to, and then see if you can get to number eight, and then I'll fill in the rest for you. And as you come up with number one or number eight, try to think of why you've decided that. What's, what does it entail?
Okay, let me bring you back together. Let's see if we can get some consensus on number one. You've got these eight possibilities in front of you of a way that you could spend your time or your resources, right? So which of these eight would be, according to the Torah, and according to you, the best? What's number one? Yep, that is number one. So good, good spotting there. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We got one. Yep. So why why would that be considered the best? What's going on there? A relation. It's, it's very relational. Okay. In a, in a, in a potentially disruptive way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Transformational. You're showing them that someone cares. Yep. You're believing in them. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's an improvement of number three because in number three, as I discussed with my colleague here, uh, when you give without asking, maybe actually people do not need your care or they take it wrong. Yep. Okay. Right. So in that case, of the prisoner, actually you offer something that actually will be highly appreciated. So you give something that actually most 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 people will be okay. Care, and it's very useful and you know. Yep. Okay. They still may not perceive it as being useful. They still may not yep. perceive it as being useful. Though. Yeah. And they're literally a cap. They're a captive audience. Um, so yeah, so you, you, you're, you're roughly right. So the way the Torah explains it is when you, hand, when you provide a hand out to an Israelite and help them up so that they don't need your hand anymore, you've done the best you can do. Okay? It's like teaching somebody to fish is better than giving them a fish. That kind of thing. You right? Their world. Absolutely. You, you've that's right. So you've hopefully provided them with something that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Now it's predicated on exactly what Tui and what Judy said. It's predicated on a relationship. And it's predicated on potentially a, a challenging relationship. Because if you're in a position to be teaching somebody, particularly a prisoner, to read, you may well not have come from that same situation that they have. Therefore, you're going to learn a hell of a lot as you do it as well. So it's a messy, long involved, probably challenging process. That's number one. Okay? Let's go to number two. What do you think number two is? So the first one is a relationship. It's a skill development. It's, it's sort of a messy thing. It's going to be a back and forth. What do you think number two is? Yep. So according to the Torah, number two would be this donating a blanket to the mission. Okay? And the way that works is that if I took a blanket to the city mission this morning and took it and you take it into the reception and you hand it across the, the desk to them, you don't give it directly to the person that needs it. They then process it. They clean it or they do whatever. They then distribute it through their networks to whoever needs it. Okay? If I bumped into the person on the street tomorrow who got my blanket that I donated today, I probably wouldn't know unless they were wearing the blanket that they had received my donation. Further, they wouldn't know that I was the one that gave them the blanket. So there's no power to it. There's no debt. There's no forced gratitude. There's no nothing, right? It's clean, okay? So you go from number one, which is about as mucky as it can get, to number two, which is as clean as it can get. And then that's the way the rest of the choices according to the Torah play out. So these two here are three and four, and they're interchangeable to a large degree. One protects the anonymity of the receiver, one protects the anonymity of the giver. Okay? This one, uh, that one, funding a public facility and naming it after you. So the way the Torah explains it is that in those times, the wealthy people were known by the way they dressed, they would walk through the poor parts of the village. They would intentionally put gold coins in the folds of their toga. And because they were distinctive by their dress, the poor people could come up behind them, take the gold coins out. The giver never knows who the receiver is. The receiver does know who the giver is. Okay? Similar to the fact that there is an Andrew Carnegie Library in Suva, Fiji. Right? All these Fijians walking in there all these years under the words Andrew Carnegie Library. They see his name. He never knew that there were Fijians using his library. But they know of his philanthropy, right? Um, then these play out, that's, that's number eight, 
being forced to do something as service. Okay. Then these go in five, six, seven. This one I disagree with because I've gotten burned by this a number of times and made to look like an ass because I've offered somebody help and they sure as hell didn't want it. <laughs> so I disagree with that one. But then those two I would agree with. But I mean, it depends on the relationships. It does? With my neighbors, there are things that I know it's okay to do. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Yes. You have a relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's predicated on the relationship. Yeah. Yep. But it does build up a potential for power. Could, could do. Could do. Yeah. And like I often have gone over and helped out um, older neighbors do something and have been quickly told, I can do that for myself. It's like, whoa. Okay. Even though they're going to spill everything and they're not doing it right, but back off. Okay. So again, these are just two quick examples of how you could take content. And this content is based on the notion of giving or volunteering, right? And how you match that up with service. So this is pretty clear content to match up. Okay. So that's just the Torah's explanations. So here are ways to make this happen. In some ways, this lining up of attributes helps us line up to our vision. So we have this vision, people prepare to make a difference. How do they do it? They do it through these four attributes. How does that play out? It plays out in our courses. So here's, some, uh, here's what we came up with a couple of years ago. So these are three characteristics of courses that would meet this attribute. Okay. So pretty open-ended, some kind of engagement with an external stakeholder. It could be physical, it could be virtual, it could be how, uh, lots of different ways. Some kind of connection and reflection on the content of the course and the engagement, and there's some assessment, and we put it at 25%. I don't even need, think you need to put a number on it necessarily, but some academics suggested that was what they thought the legitimate number was. And then the key part to me is that some aspect of the student's work could be used by the external stakeholder. So it's not just an academic exercise. So like the Geography 309 uh, work that the students do is intended to be usable by the external audience while recognizing it as a learning experience for undergraduate students and it's not going to be a professional consultation job. Okay. So we took that criteria and we applied it to all undergraduate courses at Canterbury and we found in, this was in 2013, that over 34% of all Canterbury students are having some kind of community engagement experience within a course. Those primarily reside in engineering and education. What's the percentage once you take those two colleges out? Probably single digits. <laughs> um, social work, of course, has a lot. Communication disorders. Um, lots of BSC, BCom, BA, probably not. Um, that's, that's our focus area. That's where we're trying to make some, make some improvements. Um, this year there are over 135 courses. That's up by 15 or so at least since 2011. So we have made some differences, like there are two courses in our BA in education that are different this year than they were a year ago, and we can claim those to be that. Um, then the co-curricular record is another piece to this. And with that, we think that 45%, and of course there's going to be some overlap of these and these, but still we could say that 45% of Canterbury students have an experience of engaging with the community to some degree. And again, we control the metrics. So we could say, let's double that in two years, or let's increase it by 10% or whatever. And I don't think we've quite decided how we want to play that out, but that's in our control. So here are four examples that I'll give you. So Christchurch 101, of course, we started right after the earthquakes. We do a lot of stuff out in the community, um, invite students to reflect using those tools that I've just given you, and come up with proposals that are meant to be usable. Education 205, this is a class that we tweaked this year, so this got added into the column of courses we do this in now. We took students to the Phillipstown Community Hub for three visits. It's a class about adult learning. They heard from the adult learning providers for one visit. They heard about adult learners at the next visit, then they came back and gave them ideas. And these are some gals showing them a fitness program that they came up with. 
Management 208, it's a class that we helped redesign several years ago. Um, 125 or so students, Jenny's been involved in it. Um, for the second half of the semester, they spend it all out in the field, working in small teams of four or five with community groups, trying to help them do something that they wanted to do. This was a project that um, Gap Filler did a few years ago where they put pianos all over the city right after the quakes. Geography 309 that Heather's been involved with. This uh, is Management 208 on steroids. So this class meets entirely out in the field. They have a, maybe one lecture at the beginning, a retreat at the beginning. Rest of the time, it's groups of four or five students out working with community groups. They have an academic staff supervisor, but for the most part, they're working with the community groups to help them solve problems. So they've done all kinds of different projects. This was a project um, that they did that was looking at uh, transport issues from Sumner into the city. So carpooling, cycling, all that kind of stuff. I'll leave you with this and then we can have a brief chat if anyone wants to stay over. We've just barely run over time. This is an article that was in the New York Times a few days ago, written by David Brooks called The Big University. Um, and it's some really inspiring stuff and it's all about getting universities back to their moral and their spiritual purpose. And he brings up some really good examples within his article of how the humanities have a lot to say about this and how we can look at a lot of contemporary problems through literature, poetry, sociology, etc. Because the humanities get beat up a lot for not preparing students for jobs and all that business. And he's saying, actually, nope. All of the disciplines can help prepare students for jobs, but more importantly, they should be preparing them for full and, f and enriching lives. Really, really good article. And I like the fact this was a class, a lecture theater, that I taught in this, this semester. Um, it confounds this idea of learning through small groups, relationships, and social context. It's hard to do it in that kind of place. You can do it, but it's pretty tough. It's hard to do it online as well. It's hard to do it online. And, and part of his, part of what leads ahead of this, if universities are going to justify themselves, is him saying, now with so much content online, you can actually get your academic content online, yeah. right? There's plenty of it out there. So what's the real reason to bring people together in physical proximity? And that's because we learn how to work better as a social environment and as a group. So, asking a question, what is a citizen? Absolutely. So one thing that interests me is that I've just been given this role to go out and try to attract the people of my generation to come into yep. university or back to university, but nobody's really asking, oh, how's the community to engage with the university, not vice versa, it's all coming from us, right? right? And then what's driving this is F, it's the terrible spectre of yep. F's, right? What's happened to F's yep. in the arts and mature students? So the interesting thing would be to try and find ways of getting the community engaged with the university. Yes. Not just for our benefit, but, but for all their benefits. Absolutely. Because I went with, um, with Leanne to an Age Concern Expo last week, just as an experience, and I got to talk to the Director of, of Age Concern. The first thing he said to me is, um, well, what have you asked our people about what yeah. they want? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, we're still in the model of, of we're the record shop with a bunch of albums that we're trying to sell those albums where it's a Spotify world where people can more choose what they want and they can choose specifically what they want. I don't want to come listen to 12 weeks of you yammer on about this. I want to hear that one about Kant or that one about Freud or that one about Freire. I mean, I think the university obviously has something to give, but it's just interesting to turn the framework It absolutely around, is. Not? Totally agree. About what do people need from us, not just what do we need from them in terms of Yep. Needs. Yep. Because that's just an economic driver. Yeah. And that's the model that's been forced upon us by the commodification of education. Yep. There's a really good article in the press today by Brian um, Bruce, I think it is, about what it was like when he entered university and John Key and what it's like now. Yeah. And we've all been sold into this culture. It drives us. Mm. So, but what do people in the community want? Yep, absolutely. And how do we be responsive? Yes. <laughs> how can we be responsive in delivering something that doesn't have an 18 month window of QAP approval and blah, 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 blah. Yep, cool, thanks. So that ends our formalish part of it. Happy to have some questions in chat um, and then we'll have a little bit of a break for the enrolled students who are here. Anybody wanna have any comments or thoughts about this? Yeah. Part of this, uh, what we're rolling out next year is the digital humanities. Yep. Like exactly tied into this, like 
public history, doing things actually yeah. that the community can see, like, oh, there's benefit to yeah. the humanities. Yeah. Exactly. And kids need to know about digital technology and tools, and right now we're not really teaching that. So. Yep. And know about how you tell a story or present a story. I mean, that's what Seismic was. You know, Seismic was a digital humanities way to answer a need of people sharing stories and sharing data and information about the earthquakes. Totally. Do you think there's a danger of becoming perceived as only locally applicable to the university itself? Or is there enough perception there that it's a global context and a global reality? I think we, we, we don't run the risk of being seen as too local at this point. Like somebody brought up a really good point the other night and they said, um, look at all of the stink people have kicked up over local schools being closed. But she said she's yet to see anyone from outside the university agitate for the fact that we could have very well been closed. So in other words, there wasn't enough of a perception that we were even part of a local community to even fight for us. You know, there wasn't anybody saying, we absolutely still need the second biggest employer in Canterbury to stick around because they're doing all this stuff for us. We didn't hear any of that. We had to fight for ourselves. So I think we don't, we don't run any risk right now of being too local. We're probably not local enough, to be honest. And I mean, the stuff that you do in Kaikoura, that expands our locality. You know, it makes us a bit bigger. But actually, we're not perceived as local in those places either. I know. Yeah. We're sort of the outside guy everywhere, aren't we? You know? Yeah. And, and I think we, we started to lose, we started to lose our locality probably in the 70s when we moved from the city out to here. And then it's just up until the earthquakes, it, I think it was pretty firmly entrenched. I mean, people didn't really see our students anywhere except for in the bars on Oxford Terrace. And if you did see our students, you'd sort of walk the other way because you didn't want to deal with them. And I think the student volunteer army guys were the first entree back into the city, to be honest. That was our first real big hit at having people from Canterbury somewhere other than being here. And what about the global perception into the university? Like the academic perception, I guess. I mean, in some ways, the, if you do this kind of work, um, and if you couple this into the other attribute about innovation and entrepreneurship, it makes us part of a bigger conversation that's been going on anyway. You know, there's some really cool stuff that's being done at a couple of different places in the states where they've sort of married these two things. And we've kind of tried to do that here um, in some ways with the other attribute. And when you bring those two things together, it's really kind of a cool combo of, of businessy stuff with entrepreneurship and then socially minded stuff with social enterprise. And I think it actually expands us. It, it, we get to get into that conversation. And I think we, we're still ahead of this game in New Zealand, for sure. Like, you can't find the words community engagement anywhere on the other seven websites of the universities. Lincoln has kind of cottoned on to it. Like, their, their marketing is all about now live well, eat well. You know, it's really sort of, oh, okay, go there, get a degree, do something. The other guys are trying to nibble around at that, but not as much. So we, have, we can run with this if we want. And, and the other thing uh, to, to keep in mind is that being perceived as local is not necessarily bad, given yeah. that about 60% of our uh, domestic students are from the local catchment area. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the thing is, and it was a conversation that we, we've had in, in class and that I've had with uh, the, the, the Global Aware Hub people, mm, yep. where we really we talked about uh, it's nice to be globally aware and out there in the world, but you have to be locally rooted. Yep. And you have to be perceived as being locally rooted. Yep. So for all the, the, the bruja of us being sort of the, a world leading university, we are by and large a medium sized provincial university with a large local catcher. Yep. And that is, that is not something that is a bad thing, that is just who we are, yeah. and we don't have to be ashamed of who we are. It's like, yes, yeah. we, our, our research is on par with sort of the, the, the good stuff in the rest of the world, but we are a local, uh, a local university, and that's fine. Yeah, it's a really good point. And again, it's, it's, 
you know, I just don't even think we're perceived that way. You know, if we were the same size university in a city this size in a, a sort of agricultural region that we're in in the states, people would know. People would be affiliated with us. They would see affinity with us. Whereas, I don't think people have much notion of us really. Still, in pockets they do, but not as a widespread thing. If we had a football team, though, oh, and a big stadium. Cool. Thanks, guys.